Okay, so today we will continue on from our lecture on Thursday. Thursday we talk about how do we use Linux, basically. What are the commands? How do we put in the commands? How do we copy file? How do we remove things? How do we uh, manage permission? How do we manage the uh, uh, users? How do we manage the process that are running? How do we do something like the end tasks button on Windows where we have something running and it crash your system or it's going to crash your system? How do we queue those processes? Today, we will continue on uh, the concept of using a uh, shell or Linux shell, actually. And before we begin, let me go to the first thing about public key uh, cryptography. Uh, to be honest, based on the, the other section's response to this topic, I might have additional material posted on Cisco uh, channel. So don't be surprised if I post like a few links about this. <clears throat> so it actually kind of dictates how each computer talk to each other, right? So before I begin, right, imagine the world where if I want to talk to someone else, how do you communicate to your friend? How do I, how, if, if let's say we are in a lecture room, which we don't right now, right? How do, how can I talk to you? I will speak, right? Think of a computer that way. Whenever I have to send packets over, whenever I have to send command over, whenever I have to connect to another machine, it's like someone is talking to each other by speaking. The problem that comes with that is inside the network, when you speak, people can hear, right? Think of it as a, in, in a room, right? If I say something, everyone in a room can hear what you say. So what if you want to exchange secret? What if you want to talk directly to your friend without other friends hearing? How do you do? What, how would you do that, actually? How would you do that? You can talk into different language, perfect, right? You can encrypt your message in a language that you know your friend wouldn't understand. That's a perfect example of that. I actually would give like one one great example. When I was in the United States, right? Uh, you dove to deliver a message. That's another, that's another primitive example. You can use a dove to deliver your message uh, in a room. So if there's multiple dove, that's going to be a mess. Um, that could be fun, but yeah, so I can talk to my Thai friend in the US and we can talk in Thai without no one understanding us. So the first year I'm back here in Thailand, I have to actually watch what I say. That's kind of like almost the first time in like multiple years of me being in the US. And whenever I say something in Thai, I don't have to watch what I say. <laughs> the first time I watch what I say, is kind of feel weird. Um, but, but yeah, you can use a different language in a, in a room, right? So that when you talk to your friend, no one knows what you're talking about. So the way public key cryptography is kind of like using that as a motivation, as well as a possible method to, to communicate between each computer. Why do I have to do that? Inside a network, when you connect the computer to the network, the problem is when you send a packet, that becomes a public, like almost a public information. People can eavesdrop what you submit. People can eavesdrop what you send, right? And it's really impossible to prevent someone else from eavesdropping, right? Why? Wireless signal is everywhere. You can connect to the network. You can kind of hijack the signal. I mean, you can do that, right? From the physics point of view, that's possible. So the way computer prevents someone else from listening is using cryptography. 
And the basic idea of this passwordless login, which is the last task of in-class exercise two, uh, is basically to utilize this for your connection to the server so that when you connect to the server, you don't have to put in the password, right? Because whenever you put in the password, you establish the connection to the server and use an encrypted message. So, Anyone here heard about the public key versus private key in computer science or, or that term before? I, I, I'm not talking about do you know what it is. I'm just talking whether you heard about it or not, like things like public key or private key. So for those of you who heard about it, right, what is a key? What is a key in real life? And yes, of course, in part four of our in-class uh, exercise. Uh, what is a key? What do you what do you use a key for? It, it, yeah, it's a, it's a way to open something, right? If I have a physical key, I can use it to open some lock that would get me somewhere, right? If you play a game, and you found a key, it's likely that there's some treasure in the game that you can open based on your key, right? And it works the same way here. Uh, in, in cryptography, they love to use the name Alice and Bob. Anyone wants to take a guess where does that come from? It's actually A and B, right? But we put names on it so that we, we kind of personalize the, uh, the people who are talking, including like people, in, in the context of cryptography. So person A is Alice, person B is Bob, right? So let's say Alice wants to talk to, talk to Bob. The way they can talk securely without anyone eavesdropping is Alice would first use a, a large random number, pick a large random number, right? Anything that a big, anything that a big. Then that number would be fed to our key generation program. The next slide I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but treat this as a function that takes in the input. The input is the large number. You will get basically two key, two keys. One is a public key and one is a private key, right? What does public mean and what does private mean? It basically expand on the word key, <clears throat> right? The public key is a key that you can give to people. The private key is a key that you should keep it to yourself. So in this case, Alice, once you got public key and the private key, Alice would keep the private key and give the public key to whoever Alice wants to talk to. And let's say Bob want to send a message to Alice, right? In this case, Bob want to send a message to Alice. And the message is just, hello, Alice, right? Just say, hello, world, hello, Alice. The problem with our like mainstream how network is set up is you can have the eavesdropper, most of the time eavesdropper would have the name Eve, comes in and listening to this box. The blue box here is the encrypted message, right? So what will happen if I send plain text to Alice? Can someone guess what will happen if just if I just send plain text without any encryption? It will be intercepted and everyone would know what you're talking about, right? It's like you 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 are yelling in a room. Everyone can hear you and everyone can know what you're trying to say, right? So to basically make this communication secure, right, to make this communication secure, the basic idea is Alice would give Bob the, uh, the public key. The public key will be used by Bob. So if Bob want to send Alice the message, Bob would encrypt the message with Alice's public key. Then Alice, once she got the encrypted message to decrypt, she would use her own private key. Encryption is done through a public key. Decryption done locally on your machine is 
using the private key because you have you are the only one who have that. No one else has the private key, so everyone can see the encrypted message, but no one can decrypt the message. Right? So over here, people can encrypt the message and send to Alice, but then only Alice can decrypt the message. So is that good? It is good because basically this allow, this is a mechanism that allow computer to each other and encrypt the message at the same time. While it's guaranteed that the only receiver, only intended receiver can decrypt the message. Any question about this slide? Uh, before I transition into what happened in the last step of our in-class exercise. So with our last step, we say, hey, let's make the login passwordless. It doesn't really mean you log in without any security or any encryption at all, but you kind of do the handshake already before you log in, right? So SSH, SSH stands for secure shell. That's a secure component to the shell command that you send to the server, right? In this case, whenever you log in using the password, you authenticate your existence and say, hey, I'm a legit user, here are the message. With the passwordless login, you can log in by, first of all, you generate, right? You run the command called SSH key gen, it generates two keys. This is the private key. And this is the public key. And based on our diagram from the other slides, right, to make sure that the server can authorize and say, hey, you are legit, you would copy over your public key, give it to the server. Server now knows that, hey, for this person, here's a public key, and you authorize this public key for logging in. You authorize, you basically authorize this. The server can now establish the connection between the client and the server. So this is done through the, the two-step process. First, generate the key. When you run this, you get both the private key and the public key, right? And you basically copy the content Add one more line in this authorized keys. Basically, dot SSH slash authorized keys is a list. Each line is a public key of authorized machine. Each line in this file is a public key for all the authorized machines. So you can add a new public key into this file. It basically tells SSH if I connect through here, it's legit. That's my account. All right, any questions so far? Any questions so far? Uh, if you were to mean to lock into a different server, right? Then in that case, you still have your, uh, your public key, right? So in that case, you have to inform the other server that, hey, that's your own public key. So you would then copy the public key to another server and that allows you to connect to another server using your public key. The thing is, this is SSH uh, based command, right? So inside the SSH client would remember your private key as well as a public, uh, public key. So whenever you do a SSH key gen, it generate another set of keys. So you run that once, then you copy the public key to all the next year without using the password, obviously. Any questions? 
All right, so if not, then let's continue on to uh, shell scripting. Uh, if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to type in uh, the question again. But uh, let's proceed forward uh, and resume our lecture from Thursday. On Thursday, we kind of wrap up the lecture by saying, hey, you can use Linux command this way. You can control the process this way. Today, we will start talking about how can we string together different command into a script, right? So the goal here is we want to be lazy. You want to, first of all, write a series of command in a file where you can reuse the file many times, or you can run that command. And if they take some time, you can go and get lunch before you come back and the command will be running and you're almost finished, right? That way you don't have to type things over and over and over and wait for the result of those commands. A quick example is as follow. This is one example of a, a bash a script, right? Uh, a shell script. Bash is a, a form of shell, right? There are multiple versions of shell. Bash is one of them. It's one of the more common ones. Uh, the script. First of all, should begin with this line. This line consists of two components, two components. First is called a shebang. This is called a shebang. It's basically the symbol pound and uh, exclamation mark, pound and exclamation mark. We call this shebang. What follow is a path. As you can see here, it's a path, right? It's a path to a command specifically is a command that you can use to run whatever comes next. So in this case, what follow after the shebang is basically you're telling the computer for this file, for this file, use the program slash bin slash bash to run this file. So if I replace my script with a Python script, like, you, you all use Python before, right? How do you run Python? How do you run your Python code? You would type in, for example, Python, right? File.py. But if I'm lazy, I can actually try to do dot slash file.py. It won't run until until what until i specify what program to use to run this file so in that case your shebang would change to pound ex exclamation mark slash uh, slash user slash python because that's where python is located right it would tell you what we're going through this file use python to run it same concept here you want to use bash to run the commands down here. So you specify in the shebang, you say use slash bin slash bash to run whatever come next. Is there any questions here so far? Is it clear? Any, any questions that are not clear? Okay, then let's break through the rest of this file. What does it do? Can someone tell me what does this file do? It has four commands, right? Command number one, two, three, and four. It would run these command line by line. So you would first put the text hello into test.txt. Remember this is a redirection. Redirection basically forward the output of my command. If I say echo hello, what is the output of this command? What is the output of the command echo hello? Basically a string hello, right? It would put, thank you. <laughs> so basically it would put the text hello into test.txt, copy that to text.txt, print using cat, right? Print content, which would print hello, then remove text.txt in one single bash script, right? For now, this seems useless, so I'm going to start to have more examples that can be, uh, so that it, be, it will be more clear on what else can you do with this. But before we go there, let's 
have variable because if you want to code something up, you better, sometimes you need to rely on variable, right? You store a value and use it later. There's a quick name restriction, use letter, use number and use underscore and that's it. Use letter, number and underscore. The way you assign variable is the variable name, this is variable name, followed by equal, equal signs means that text, whatever to the right, assign to, to uh, whatever to is to the left. So in this case, it would take this string, right? You all are, are familiar with the concept of string, right? Take the string, put it in the variable called greeting. Over here, who am I is a command. Who am I would print the username. Print the username. Can someone give me a username that I can use here as an example? Uh, Bob, sure. So in this case, the variable greeting will have, so this is a variable and this is a value, right? Greeting would have what value? It would have the, the string welcome, right? The variable user in this case will have the string Bob because user said Bob is a username, right? From, from our uh, text. And then variable called day, uh, date is another command here. This is a command. The option here that's to uh, percent A is basically print the day of, like basically what day is today. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? So what day is today? It's Tuesday. So in this case, day is Tuesday. If you run this script tomorrow, it will change to Wednesday. Right, because it's a variable based on a command. Then the next line I say echo, right? In quote, reading back user, today is day, which is the best day of the entire week. Over here, things inside this double quotation, note that double quotation is a string, right? But if you put in dollar sign in front of something, the dollar sign specify, go get the value of that variable. So in this case, we'll print, welcome back, Bob. Today is Tuesday, which is the best day of the entire week. Then one more thing I want to point out is you can also use the environment variable. You can print or check the value of environment variable. Why is this useful? For example, there are variables to tell what is the version of the C compiler that you're using. What is the variable that say, what is the version of Linux that you're using? If the version is wrong, you can say, hey, install Linux, this version, otherwise this program would not run, right? So it, it can be really, really useful to check the condition before you install a program, before you run certain program, to make sure everything is set up properly, all right? So this is how you use variable in a shell script. And here are more example over here. This is a script. If you want to put in comments, right? You put in pound. The pound key means that this line is a comment. Again, this script basically uh, in the comment, it would read this is used to back up your the user home directory to slash temp, right? Now you can see an, an example that's more useful. If you run this script, it would copy all the content of that folder, group them together into one compressed file, and put that into a slash temp slash certain location. What is that location? I would first say user, who am I, right? Why do I need it? I would need this particular variable. Oh, that's a great question. The question is, is this and this double quote and single quote, are they the same? Uh, they, yeah, same. The answer is they are not. 
in a few slides, we'll actually expand into that. So please wait for a few more slides. They are different and I'll tell you how. But now we want to assign the variable called input, all right? So let's say right now the username again is Bob, right? So input would be slash home slash Bob. And output, output would be slash temp slash Bob underscore home underscore and the date goes here dot tar dot gzip, right? So that would be the output. And then the next command you say, hey, run this tar command. From lecture two, we learned that the tar command group all the file together into one single archive file, dash C, over here, dash C. C mean compress, C mean compress. And you use a zip, uh, by default, if I remember correctly, this is using bzip2, it's one of the compression algorithm, to compress your file into one single archive file call something something dot tar dot gzip. Oh, actually it's gzip, not bzip2, my bad, my bad. By default, this would use uh, an algorithm called gzip, would put file into uh, one of the output location, right? And the next line say backup of this folder, completed details about the output backup file, and the next line would be ls-l, which would show you the uh, the 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 list command at the output location. So when you run this script, it would actually gather every file in your home directory, compress that, put it in the output location. All right. So now, I've see I've shown you some example of how to use variable, and there's also some restriction on the variable name. The reason behind that is there's also some special variable. For example, dollar sign pound would give you a number. The number means the total number of arguments when you run the script. For example, let's say you have the script called test.sh, right? So when you run test.sh, for example, uh, dot slash test.sh, one, two, three, like three separate input. The first input is number one, followed by number two, followed by number three. There are four, four arguments. This is the first argument. This is the second argument. This is the third argument. And this is the fourth argument. When you use dollar sign followed by number, it represents the string of each argument. So when you say dollar sign zero, that's the name of the script, dollar sign one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three, that means it's the first input, the second input, the third input, so on and so forth. For example, if you run the command cat, a.txt, b.txt, and c.txt, cat would be stored in the variable dollar sign zero, a.txt will be stored at dollar sign one, b.txt is in dollar sign two, and c.txt is in dollar sign three. All right, then another special symbol, both of them are the same, dollar sign store and dollar sign at, they are all the command line arguments. So in this case, it'll be cat, a.txt, v.txt, c.txt, the whole thing. And one last thing, if you put quote around it, it basically would actually put the quote to all the command line arguments. Dollar sign question mark is the exit status of the last program to exit. For example, if you have multiple shell script running after another, depending on the exit status of the program, you can script it such that it handles different status accordingly. Right. And now let's go back to one of the questions on the chat, and that's a great question. What's the difference between different version of quoting, right? So dealing with quote, any unquoted string, they are string, like they are normally interpreted. When you have a quoted string, these are literal string. 
that becomes as an actual like string data type. But with a double quote, notice this is a double quote. When you put in dollar sign followed by a variable name, you want the data. You want what goes into that variable. For example, if that variable contain number 10, this gets replaced by 10. For a single quote, single quote, dollar sign variable name literally means dollar sign variable name. For example, let's go back and review lecture two. What is this variable? Can someone tell me what dollar sign path? Can someone tell me what's a dollar sign path? It's an environment variable. And what, what is a store? What does path store? It's a way to all the different directory, right? It's, it's store all the different directory. Each directory, whenever you run a command on your system, it would search, is the command here, is the command in here, is the command in here, is the command in here, on all the directory listed under path. It's a way to all the possible command that would use by default when you want to set it up here. Uh, you mean you want to set up your machine. For example, the ls command is located at slash bin slash ls. In that case, the path would have slash bin inside it. So whenever I do double quote dollar sign path, I really, what I mean here is, it's going to get replaced by the actual path, those directory lists, right? Double quote dollar sign path means that I'm going to print, I'm, I'm basically, this string is the list of all the directory. What happened if I do single quote path? Can someone tell me what, what is the string here? If I use single quote path. It, yes, exactly. It would print dollar sign p a t h rather than going into the list of directory it will it literally interpret this as dollar sign p a t h one more thing if you do this quote like this type of quote uh this type of quote inside is the command when you have the inside of this type of quote it, a, a command what it means is you're gonna execute the command and then the output the output of that command is inserted into the quote as if it's assigned to a like as if that's a variable basically the output goes into the string the output goes into the string all right so here uh, uh any questions basically you can put in the variable you can put in the command. The command basically would treat the output as the, the, the part of the string. So that's how you can combine variable name, variable itself, the command into uh, a output that you want, right? So now that we have a, a way to deal with variables, we have a way to deal with, condi uh, no, no, that's the next slide, a way to deal with quotes. The next thing I want to talk about is dealing with conditional statement, if else or loop. Before you go to through if else or for loop, the first thing you have to figure out is how do I compare? And here is a table that would explain how. In bash script and shell script in general, it treats data based on two types. Either those are number or they are string. Simple, right? Either they are number or they are string. When your data is a number, to compare, you do dash followed by the letter. LT stands for less than. For example, if you say 100-EQ50, this is, is 100 equal 50? Is 100 equal 50? 
Uh, yeah, they couldn't op overload the operator. The 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 batch like the shell script is really 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 simple. It's like really primitive way. That's why a lot of people actually move on to using a combination of Python and Bash script together, right? Because in Bash, in the in a Bash script, it can be annoying, but in Python script, it's actually much less annoying. Uh, if it's a string, then you can use a symbol, right? Less than, greater than, equal, and not equal. For example, is GNU equals Unix? It will compare the two string, right? One thing to note, see how I put space bar in between symbol, including the bracket. These are additional space that allow the script to parse that, hey, that's the beginning of your bracket. And the next thing that come afterward is another separate object, like a, a, a separate thing, right? Uh, so over here, you have white space in. There'll be another example that's more clear because it has a black like background and you can clearly see the space. But this is one of the most common bugs in your assignment one in previous uh, semester, you forgot the space bar between the brackets. Okay, so this is one of the more common bugs. Uh, here are the example. What will get print here? What will get print here? Notice how now I, I have if, then else, and then I finish the if else statement with fi. Fi is, fi is kind of like that end of the if else block, right? So what will get print here? What's the result if I run this uh, script? Four hundred is greater than two hundred. All right, so this script will print four hundred is greater than two hundred. Why? Num a is going to be four hundred. Num b is two hundred. It will check the condition is four hundred less than two hundred. That's false because it's false. You go into the else statement and print four hundred is greater than two hundred. And here are example. You can do if then and then close the block with if i. You can do if, then, else, and fi. You can even do if, then, elif, else if, then, elif, else if, then, else, and then fi. This also works, right? So these are how can you use if, else statement. If you want to use for loop, what will get print here? Again, uh, the code is short. Remember for in some kind of range, right? This is a range that you want to loop around. Do, and then at the end say done. It kind of specify the end of the loop for each iteration. So in here, it would print one, two, and three. So this is an example of a for loop. You can do also a while loop. It yes, it does look as like a pseudo code, but make sure you have the correct syntax uh, in order to make it work. You can do it the while loop while counter is less than three. Do let counter plus equal one basically means that I'm gonna increment counter by one and then you echo counter so it will be one two and three again so before we are going to head off and work on our in class exercise let me ask you what does this do first of all there's a file called item.txt and inside the file it contains three lines bash scripting tutorial so what does this do? Oh. 
what what does this do? Remember this vertical bar? This is pipe. Pipe mean that I'm gonna take an output of the first command, the earlier command, and feed it as an input into the next command. It's actually almost word count dash c is not a word count, it's character count, but the rest you got it correctly. Word count dash c is a character count. So it would print instead of word count, which is going to be one, 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 right? Because each line is one word. In this case, it would print four, nine, and eight, right? So it basically prints four character, eight, uh, nine character, and then eight character. Why is that the case? You're basically looping the output of cat item dot text. Uh, echo dash n, make sure these are number. Feed the output as the uh no let, let me double check actually I kind of forgot what echo dash n do let me double check give me give me a few seconds check just in case I I I don't want to get it wrong Oh, okay. My bad. I, yeah, I, 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 it's good that I checked. Dash N is don't include the new line. Thank you. Yes, on the text. Dash N is basically don't include new line. So when you do echo dash N dollar sign I, it basically means that I'm going to treat this input and don't include that new line so that each letter becomes B A S H without the new line. Otherwise, it might be five, ten, and nine. So in this case, don't include new line and do the word count on each word. All right, so is that clear? All right, awesome. And you see an example, I literally go and check the manual, right? Because whenever you see the command, there's no way we can remember every single command, right? So sometimes you check the manual because that can be a really, really helpful option. In this case, yeah, don't include the new line is a really helpful option. All right, so that actually kind of almost a wrap of this class. For the lecture part, we are not done. We're just done with the lecture part. But here are additional tutorials. Uh, it's the same link as last week on Thursday. You can check it out. It basically have a tutorial uh, for bash scripting and some example. And today we will focus on finishing up the rest of our in-class exercise, exercise one, two, and three. And if you finish already, awesome. We have assignment one, which is basically another more practical use of Linux. Uh, script uh, shell scripting. So if you're done with all the in class exercise, please use the remainder of these lecture time to ask me questions. Uh, basically, work on assignment one. Ask me questions if you run into something, so that I can give you hints about how to do certain things that we are asking you to do. All right. Uh, that's it for the lecture portion today. So let me stop the recording. In the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to type it on the chat.